and good night to whoever you may be in the world. This is Dr. Barry London of News, and I've got a few clips from Sky News, which the program is The Outsider on Sky News. Fantastic. This time they're talking about, well, about the temperature rises, and I got to be very careful what I say, but this will, of course, will be on, on a rumble, so I'll pop across to rumble. I'll put as much as I can up on YouTube because we don't want to upset the system. But this will give you an indication of how the Labour Party, which is owned and controlled by a bigger party overseas somewhere, I think it's called the USA. My next video will be on our wonderful so-called Governor General. This hypocrite on the very weak end of the Queen's Jubilee in England was talking about this place becoming a republic. Here is this absolute criminal. I mean, he's sitting there swearing in Albanese, the prime minister, the Labour Party, which destroyed the country, with the Queen's emblem behind his back and as the governor general. I mean, this guy will be going before a grand jury on the Common Law Court International as soon as possible. So watch this space. Thanks for watching. Let's watch the video now. Sorry. Good morning and welcome to Outsiders, the show that is to political correctness gone mad and woke virtue signaling what Anthony Fauci is to transparency and clarity of motive in the world of information. which many public health experts and intelligence officials believe to be the source of around the world are clamoring to halt the spread of the monkeypox virus although some people believe they might have already contracted the disease say there is nothing much to be alarmed about <laughs> to worry about honestly as long as you take plenty of potassium and eat lots of bananas you'll be absolutely fine <laughs> other experts disagree pointing to what are believed to be the potential dangerous side effects of the monkeypox monkey virus with one patient complaining of symptoms including acute bodily twitching spasmodic <laughs> gyrations of the pelvic region and delusions of being well a monkey man <laughs> And now, let's grab the latest Outsiders News. Well, it's the Jubilee, the Platinum Jubilee. Congratulations to Her Majesty, 70 years on the throne, and what a sensational job she has done. As Andrew Neil pointed out in the Daily Mail, this does put the lie to the idea that Britain is some kind of racist, terrible uh, nation. You've seen the most amazing photos, Rita and James, of people mm -hmm. in every shade of colour, of ethnicity, of racial background, all celebrating joyously in London. And we'll be chatting to Annalisa Nilsson shortly from a pub of Outsiders fans right there celebrating in the UK. So we'll get back to that. But we also want to talk a little bit just about David Hurley. Sorry, yes. Sorry, I've got to mention it right off the top here. David Hurley. James. Well, <laughs> this, is, this is an absolute disgrace. The Governor General 
in the UK, asked about uh, the Queen, asked about a republic. You know, this is this new thing that Alba was pushing, a republic which he did not go to the election on. And he says, oh, well, you know, after the Queen goes, we'll have that discussion. So there is David Hurley, a Morrison appointment, by the way, yeah, uh, talking about, Governor talking General. about yeah. the death of the Queen at her jubilee, trying to curry favor, you can only imagine, with the Albanese government, who has appointed a minister for the Republic, which, let's think about this, a minister of the Crown, whose job as a minister will be to undermine the Crown. How does that well, work? What I don't know. Under, what they've undermined is the sanctity of the oath. Mm. Yes. These ministers swear an oath to the Crown. That's why we vote them in on the understanding, Rita, that they will swear allegiance to the Crown of Australia. Here they are busily undermining it. It's a, it's a disgrace. But the, the Governor General is the Queen's representative. So for him to be talking like this is even, I think, it's more grave than a minister doing it. Uh, but you're right. It wasn't mentioned during the election. This is why they built the Tower of London. They built the Tower of London. <laughs> put him in there. Rowan. Someone put David yeah. Hurley in there. Chuck Mace, Matt Thistlethwaite in as well and locked the keys. I just thought he was... The timing couldn't be worse. It was undignified. Everyone around the world, particularly in the Commonwealth nations, is celebrating the Queen, her incredible service. And you mentioned people from all shades and nationalities and backgrounds. The Queen is loved by migrant communities. It's yes. something that the Labor Party may want to acquaint itself with. Uh -huh. Now, if they want to think long term or medium term and say, at some point when we have a King Charles, that might be an opportunity to have the debate again about the referendum and the Republic, fine, but to be doing it during her Diamond Jubilee, I mean, really? But even that, Rita, even that, Rita, you know, poll after poll shows that support for the Republic is waning, especially among young people. Young people are actually very, uh, you know, pro the Queen, pro the monarchy, um, and this whole notion that, you know, these sort of aging boomers like Peter Fitzsimons, you know, <laughs> are going to wind up becoming the new aristocracy of Australia, I think is just... A nonsense, and people see it for what it is. Well, well look, it's I... more insidious than that because I, I, I don't trust Labour on this at all. They uh, they will start to try and conflate uh, the push for uh, a voice. So they'll try try start to try and conflate all these various things which attack our constitution. So a new voice in the constitution. Suddenly the monarchy will be oh that's colonialism, that's racism. Mm. You know oh let's they'll conflate so these different issues. So it's interesting that you say they're, that. They're attacking the kids. This is what they always do. They will be teaching the kids, the assistant minister for uh, this bloke Thistlethwaite, what's he going to do for three years? He's going to get into the schools and be teaching the schools that the monarchy has to change. And this is what Labour are up to. Do not trust them. They will use the teachers' unions. They will do what they've done on climate. They will do what they do in everything. They will use our children. Well, well, well this is a great segue to this because, you know, this is all part of this whole, you know, Keating, you change the government, you change the nation yep. thing that Albanese is on about. Well, what is one of the things that they've said now? Jason Clare, the new education minister, has said, the curriculum wars are over. Well, it's like, really? really? Yes. And if you notice it, <laughs> this whole thing, guys, where what they're trying to do is to make it so that you can't question anything, you know, so the debate about climate is over, we don't debate that anymore, Final that's done, you know, over, the yeah, curriculum yeah, wars, wars are over, the, the culture wars, over, over, the monarchy you know, war, the Republican over, war, the voice over, war, the over, 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 federal elections, Labor's won two outright, so they don't win them too often, but when they win them like they did in 07, it's the end of the debate. Yeah. It's like this is the final decision that nation has made, the debate's over, this is what we're well, doing. Whilst when the coalition win an election, conservatives win an election, well, it just shows that we've got a lot to learn. <laughs> and the debate <laughs> continues. So uh, this is at least, you know what, you've got to give Labor credit for actually pursuing its agenda and going after it ruthlessly yep, and trying to implement it. They, they won't wait for these three years implementing their far left agenda, whilst when the coalition are in, what are they doing? Yeah, yeah well, exactly. This but... goes to this idea of the culture wars, Rita, which is where when the left uh, do it, it's not the culture wars, right. it's just no. doing Progress. our agenda. But yeah. when the, anyone <laughs> speaks up and says, oh, no, no, we're not sure about this, uh, you know, uh, blokes being uh, Sheilas and all the rest of it. <laughs> oh, you're, you're fighting the culture, culture wars. wars. Yeah, 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 that's why our side has to play the by their wars. rules. So every time they pursue this far left 
sometimes just fruitcake agenda, you've got to call it what it is. You've got to say, this is another culture war attack by Labor. This is another lurch to the left. But sadly, conservatives don't do that. They don't pursue their own agenda. They occasionally play defence. But even that, they don't do too well. Well, I'll tell you what, though. I'll tell you what, though. You know, the Albanese government is going to be in for some surprises if they think they can manage to convince everybody not to say anything about all of these crucial issues when they've come in on the lowest primary vote yep. seven in out of ten over 100 voted years. Again. Seven out of ten people voted uh, for somebody else. Now, I know there was some strategic voting in some seats you know, around the Teals, which we'll talk about a bit later on. But that said, you know, they do not have the mandate that they think they do for a radical remaking of Australian society, and which is what they, they are trying care. to get over the line. That's As right. I say, on curriculum, on climate, on they will, the Jack. voice and everything else. But they will. They've got a majority in the lower house, which I think is actually a good thing because it saves them from negotiating with those crossbenchers. But in the upper house, they have to negotiate with the Greens and Pocock. So what do you think they're going to deliver? Do you think it's going to be centrist policy or is it going to be more of this loony left, nation-destroying, yeah, identity politics obsessed... reshaping, yeah. and this is why the, uh, it is so important that the Dutton opposition uh, is a strong opposition that sticks to conservative values. Let's talk about that for a second, uh, because I'm afraid, I hate to say it, but the disastrous appointment of... Uh, uh, of getting rid of Barnaby Joyce. Uh, so the, the Nats, I've got a new slogan for the Nats. What's that? Lots to be ashamed of, little to be proud of. <laughs> so um, that's, that's their week in politics. They've delivered us nothing. Thank you very much, Nationals. Uh, apparently this bloke, Little Proud, sees himself, Rita, as the sensible centre. Oh. I've got news for you, David Little Proud. I'm the sensible centre. This show is the sensible centre. Everything over there is on the left. On the right, you have some, some, some other some conservative things, but this show is the sensible <laughs> centre, and I'm sticking that to that because you, David Little Proud, are so far out on the left, you've got no idea. There is no way that people are going to support the nationals if they stick to net zero. Within three years, net zero will be as toxic a phrase as pink bats. Well, that's what I'm guaranteeing you, and you will have, I predicted here, Little Proud will go the way of Michael McCormick, and we must have Matt Canavan as the leader of the Nats running into the next election so that, even though he's in the Senate, we'll work that out, so that Dutton and Canavan provide the opposition which this country is going to need to get us back on track after three years of Labor. He's like a even lower energy McCormack, isn't he? I mean, <laughs> why, I mean, why would you go there? The ideology is questionable at best. And I've had a lot of complaints about Barnaby, I've got to admit. But at the end of the day, the Nationals held their seats. Everyone, they yep. are the only part of the coalition that actually performed as expected. And yet, he loses his gig. And this, well, uh, and I'll tell you, Dutton, I just want to say one yeah. thing. He spoke again um, today, or what could have been yesterday. I'm getting confused with my days. He spoke on the weekend. Mm. And what he said again gave me faith that he knows precisely where the coalition's future Good. is and where the voters are. He distanced himself from the big end of town, the business community, the big corporations, and said our constituency is the workers, small business, mm -hmm. and that's borne out by all the stats if you look at the last yeah. election, yep. uh, the latest election. Yep. And, and that's right. That. Well, yeah, and, 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 you know, it's really interesting too because, of course, big business has gone so woke and decided to, you know, go for every virtue signaling thing under the sun. You know, they've got this whole ESG thing, which is basically, you know, mm. Marxism wrapped up yeah. uh, with a little capitalist bow. Um, but what's really fascinating to me too is this whole nationals push to the center and everybody except for Peter Dutton is racing for the center. This is actually a disastrous move for a couple of reasons. Number one, no differentiation. They're going to split this huge centrist vote. Number two, it's actually for all of like, oh, it's so nice for all the center. It's a sensible center and all of this. But really what's going to happen here is it's going to make people more tribal because they're not going to all agree with the different people that are in that center, so they're going to just stick to their political tribe. And we saw this with the Teals, and there was a fascinating story which said that the uh, labor seats now um, have an $8,580 annual pay gap with liberal seats, which are actually poorer off now. And it's what's fascinating split. to me then exactly. is that the Teals 
who are all in these seats that are very high income, very well, they actually can't bring themselves simply for tribal reasons, not for political reasons, to go with labor. So to me, I think this is interesting. And as far as the Nats are concerned, they've got to watch out because they will wind up just like the woke New South Wales division. Of I, the I, I, this is why I'm saying. Teals, I think that te- those teal seats, if there weren't some, uh, you know, very well promoted teal option, they would have gone with Labor. They, and we've seen that in the UK, we've yeah. seen that in the US, where these traditionally conservative areas, once they get very well, affluent, like go to left. In London. That's it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we saw it with Higgins. Uh, Kate, Katie Allen lost her seat to the Labor candidate. So it is absolutely gettable. And the coalition has to forget about these handful of affluent seats and look at the opportunity, the masses of people in the suburbs, the regions, who identify now with those values, who Labor have left behind. Absolutely. And, it, and, and, and Peter Dutton seems to understand that. He, he seems does. to be the only He's one the in the coalition. The, the, our Westminster that. system works on opposition, and op- strong opposition being there to hold the government to account. This idea that... The, Everything's over, the climate wars are over. No, 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 they're just beginning. And the point is that net zero will drive our economy uh, right down the gurgler. We've already seen three days in, and Labor, uh, congratulations to her, the new resources minister, Madeleine King, is out there saying, oh, hang on, hang on, not so fast on coal. We need coal. Now, she's from WA, good on her, she's smart, but she recognises already Labor recognise that they're, they're not getting rid of coal anytime soon. And I guarantee you, on to what Rita was saying, what James was saying, about the fact that more and more a blue-collar, working-class, aspirational, small-business Australian, Australians are backing the coalition, and it's the wealthy, woke, those who can afford it, who back Labor. Come three years' time, the people of Australia will be crying out to get rid of net zero and to have a strong coalition government in power that rejects net zero and climate lunacy. Already, what a joke. Did you see earlier on a Sky this morning, Chris Bowen, the new uh, climate change minister, standing there freezing cold, <laughs> talking about, four about layers. global warming with his bright red nose, <laughs> shivering in the cold. Canberra has just had the coldest consecutive three days in over a decade, and these clowns are talking about global warming and, dis- and, and going to destroy your small business, your family bank balance, your whole entire uh, Parents and grandparents' warmth and security because they're chasing this lunacy about global warming <laughs> while they're freezing and all our ski resorts are opening earlier. Oh, oh, no, hell, 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 no, 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 no. Sorry, Rowan. <laughs> Uh, the ski resorts, they're not supposed to be open. That's we were supposed right. to never see any Ooh. snow again. Do we have the <laughs> images here from some of these predictions yes. that, uh, yes. that some of the newspapers have oh, had? Oh, here we go. 2011. The future. The future. No, well, well not 2011. So not. Not. Snow, 2017. snow retreat, climate change puts Australia's ski industries on a downhill slope. When was that? A few years ago. There you go. 2017. There that you one go. Was. There you go, Rita. Climate change could shrink Australia's ski season by 80% by 2050. That's another one. That was from 2000. So these catastrophic predictions, and we have seen them, uh, we, it's, it's more useful when they're eight or ten year predictions because there's some memory of them. But if you go back 20, 30 years and look some of the predictions that were widely accepted and just see how wildly wrong they are, there's, again, no reckoning. We just keep making policies and damaging ourselves based on these predictions how many of times, doom and gloom. How many times have we seen, you know, the front page of one of the Fairfax papers or some other, mm. you know, lefty media outlet with the picture of, you know, the Harbour Bridge just poking <laughs> out, you know, <laughs> under the sea waters from the rising, you know, all of uh. Sydney inundated, you know, Manhattan inundated, all of... Well, you know, and yet the funny thing is all these people who are the biggest climate change advocates also all live harborside, waterfront. It's so funny. There's a certain former prime minister who said that uh, global warming was the great moral challenge of our time who happens to live right on Sunshine Beach. There you go. There you go. And Malcolm's quite close to the water too, (laughs) I think. Exactly. Uh, Obama, John Kerry, Al Gore, the list goes on. But it struck me that uh, Chris Bowen has already, doesn't surprise me, already been struck by the curse of Al Gore, and that's the immutable law of physics, <laughs> whereby the moment you start banging on about global warming, the temperature turns freezing cold, colder than it's been in a decade.
decade. Well done, Chris Bowen. You looked really uncomfortable standing there, and I hope you were freezing your whatever's off. But, um, but a big boost for the ski economy. You know, yes, done, that's what we want. Had a hard couple of years with COVID. So, well, all you know, those good old labor skis. making, make, you know, doing oh, the, the teals. Love yeah, it. Yeah. Well, it wasn't Zali a skiing person. Well, we're not just Zali, but I can tell you the uh, the people in, in all those teal seats, but uh, certainly the ones in Melbourne that I'm familiar with, are very big skiers. <laughs> they'll be rushing so off to be the snow. Them yeah, we're going to go all week gas early. guzzling. Yeah, that's going and you know that's not when they're flying off to aspen or, or some Whistler. Swiss uh. or ski resort so i mean that's the thing the people we should someone should actually have a look at the carbon footprint of a typical uh, resident in a teal seat compared to a oh, national uh, or liberal I, I seat you know, in the outer suburbs. Uh, I think you need to ask too hard, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but speaking of climate change lunacy, which is what it is, uh, in France, we've had a couple of great protests this week. Uh, in France, a girl, a young girl, uh, tied herself to the net at oh. Roland Garros. Uh, and I think you've got your thoughts on that, oh, Rita. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. But she said, we have 1,028 days left. Left, no, not for the game of tennis, Why but, for, in but for yeah, exactly. But for the world to end in a climate catastrophe, I've worked out that that date is April the first, April Fool's Day, uh, 2025, which uh, could could be uh, important. But um, no, no, so I don't do think, think it was a joke. I think I think uh, if you if you uh, look at yeah, no, I don't think it was an April Fool's joke. But I just think when they do protests like this, like when they super glue themselves to buildings mm. or to roads. Well, just put some cones around them and get on with it. Now, she get was right the at the edge of the net, so she wasn't within the lines. They should have just kept playing. And if the occasional ball oh. came near her, well, then she's put herself in that position. I don't know why we give them the attention they seek. We had the Mona Lisa well, the attacked. Mona, got, well, the Mo- Mona Lisa was attacked by a guy who dressed up as an old woman. I don't know if this was a transgender protest as well. Who knows? <laughs> but anyway, he dressed himself up as birds. a wheelbound, so it could be a disability protest as well. He attacks the Mona Lisa. There he is. And he's in French. He goes on about La Planète or La Terre or whatever it is. So he's a climate change protester trying to damage one of the great paintings. Hey. Why are the, why are why are the, the security great, people uh, being so very gentle Yeah, with the Mona Lisa is yeah. one of the great uh, works of art of Western civilization. He tries Try. to damage that. But here's the thing, Rita and James. I'm sorry. There is no difference philosophically between those people and someone like Mike Cannon Brooks who wants to shut down uh, AGL, Mm. coal-fired power plants, in order to satisfy his ideological leanings. There's no difference. You are damaging uh, property or you are damaging uh, industry or you are making it harder for people to warm their houses. If you embrace net zero, you are no different to that clown who is... uh, there at the Mona Lisa or the girl at Roland Garris. Well, no, exactly right, except that at least Mike Cannon Brooks is trying to make a buck out of it, so you can say that for him. This girl and the guy at the Mona Lisa, you know, they're just doing it for God knows what publicity or to, you know, get kudos when they go back to their share house at night. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, I mean, they're brainwashed. I don't know the age of the, uh, the Roland Garros protester, but, you know, she looks to She's be in her early 20s. Yeah. Um, and... Probably has, has been fed this catastrophist uh, nonsense for a good decade of her life at school, through the media. So, in a way, I do feel a little bit sorry for them because these people genuinely believe that the world's ending in a few years. They've been taught this, and this is why it was so stupid of Scott Morrison and now this David Littleproud character to rush around embracing this insane Marxist ideology. Well, one of the great tragedies of the Morrison government is that Alan Tudge was not able to blow up the entire Australian curriculum, which Julia Gillard saddled the nation with during the Rudd Gillard government, and which has in it those explicit cross-curricular priorities, including the environment that essentially makes teachers insert green ideology yep. into every lesson where they can, especially in science, which becomes more science uh, because it's all about, you know, climate change. But there's also the, you know, the Asian uh, engagement one. And then there's also um, the indigenous voice oh, as well. Yeah. So it's all about pushing left-wing ideas through the curriculum very explicitly. And it's a real tragedy, I think, guys, that Scott Morrison and Alan Touch were not able to blow that up 
before he left government. Well, that is why you elect conservative governments. And if they're not willing to do what their constituents want, then vote them out. And you know what? I think conservatives across the country should get together, maybe do some fundraising and send a massive gift or a cheque to Simon Holmes Accord, because in one election <laughs> he has Thank rid you, the Simon. party. Great Thank you, job. Simon. Well done. You have rid the party of, <laughs> of the, the wetters, of yep. every element that has stopped it being a proper centre-right party that has got a clear ideology and direction. And now it's going to realign under Peter Dutton and it'll go to the electorate and we'll see if that's something they'll back or not. Here, they here. certainly did with Tony Abbott. He won in a landslide. He was... We're told it was unelectable. Yeah, I tell you, John Dutton, Howard was Mr. Nineteen Percent. Remember, no, he no was unelectable too. There's no reason why Dutton can't win in a landslide at the next election. No reason if he sticks to his conservative philosophies. We've even seen in Britain now, for example, uh, you know, people do react to the madness. It's not like it goes on forever. We have uh, the Attorney General in Britain, Suella Braverman who has turned around and she's gone head on to the trans uh, agenda. She said that J.K. Rowling is her heroine uh, and she said that teachers should not be pandering to trans pupils. And she's gone on to basically say that all the nonsense about pronouns and which school uniforms, she's reiterated that girls' lavatories are for girls and changing rooms are for girls. Everything we've talked Hi, about here yeah. on the show, everything that, for example, Catherine Deves went to the election with, the Attorney General now is saying that in the UK. So these things do change if enough mm-hmm. parents speak up about them, Rita. And we're seeing a change in the US. as a grassroots campaign. They've got school board elections there where parents are aware of what their kids are being told in classrooms and they've said no more. So they're t- taking over the school boards and making sure they get to back to basics, actually academic excellence as opposed to far-left indoctrination. And it's flowing on. We've had... Uh, it states Virginia change uh, government yeah, based yeah, on these yeah. issues. So if the conservatives think this is something that's a trivial issue that people don't care about, no, these are consequential issues about exactly. what your children are thought, the and values your country embraces. And and too often, Rita, too often, Rita, I'm sorry, but, you know, like, whatever the curriculum says, the fact of the matter is that many in the teaching profession explicitly try to undermine Australia, they try to undermine the family, they try to undermine the values of parents, and this is why we get a new generation of young voters who've all come out and they all misestimate by a factor of 10, you know, the amount of carbon emissions that we put out into the atmosphere, everything else about the environment, and that's because they've been taught, I use those words in quote, uh, in the schools. Yeah, they've been brainwashed. But Soon we'll be note, speaking to a young citizen journalist exposing the hypocrisy of the powerful elite at the World Economic Forum. But first, let's take a quick minute and check on the most powerful woman in America, the Veep, Kamala Harris, who yesterday was in Reno, Nevada, to speak at the US Conference of Mayors. mayors as if they're in the second grade. She seems to talk to everybody on that level. Isn't it reassuring to know that Kamala is just one 80-year-old heartbeat away from becoming the most powerful human on the planet? Now to matters closer to home. Something has gone terribly wrong when a prosperous first world nation blessed with an abundance of natural resources has energy costs so high that people are too frightened to cool their homes in the hottest months or heat them in the coldest. The climate catastrophists who shriek the loudest about global warming being an urgent crisis that threatens lives are rather blasé about a deadly crisis they've helped create. They claim people are dying due to global warming when the truth is that the cold weather kills in greater numbers than any warming. And tragically, soaring energy costs will undoubtedly see more vulnerable people die with increasing numbers of Australians not adequately heating their homes in the coldest months. It should be a source of a national shame that so many pensioners, low-income earners and even some middle-income households are opting to remain cold rather than risk bill shock by turning on the heater. 
There are people who are, or should be, enjoying their golden years, staying in bed until early afternoon, not because they fancy a sleep in, but because it is the warmest place in the house and it means they can delay turning on the heating. Three years ago, I wrote about research conducted by doctors at the Alfred and academics from Monash University showing people who had been indoors presenting to hospitals with hypothermic emergency. The 2019 paper published in the Internal Medicine Journal revealed that in just two inner city emergency departments, more than 200 patients presented with hypothermia, with 23 people dying over a seven year period to 2016. About 80% of the patients presenting with hypothermic emergency were found indoors and close to three quarters of all patients were pensioners. If that is not appalling enough, consider that those stats reflect what happened in just two emergency departments and only up to 2016. As we know all too well, energy costs have increased significantly since then and are about to skyrocket further, due largely to self-inflicted harm caused by policies to reduce emissions. Interestingly, the author of the 2019 study is now the member for Higgins, Dr Michelle Anada Raja. This is what she said back in 2019. She said, we're seeing patients who are clearly coming in profoundly hypothermic and being found indoors. Hypothermia is generally not something that happens suddenly. When you get to a certain temperature, you're vulnerable to sudden death. But during the election campaign, there was not much said about hypothermic patients, but plenty about slashing emissions further and more meaningful action on climate change. Never mind that such action, as we have seen in Europe and North America, invariably leads to greater unreliability and significantly higher costs. We're in this mess because successive state and federal governments have embraced climate change policies that have sunk billions into renewable sources of energy and neglected gas, coal and nuclear. Not just neglected, but in some cases demonised and banned these reliable sources of cheap energy. Sadly, the numbers of Australians whose health will deteriorate due to prolonged exposure to cold temperatures is set to increase in line with soaring energy costs. Rita, that was superb, but I just want to just clarify this. This uh, Dr. Michelle Ananda Rajar, she's a Labour member for Higgins, Ooh, correct? She beat Katie Allen, yeah. What a frigging hypocrite. I'm sorry, that makes me sick. I mean, we said on this program back in 2019 that people might die of the cold. Now, you're saying she did a report into this, and yet she, she supported was one of the, authors, the yeah. Albanese net zero proposals and slashing, getting rid of coal. You hypocrite. Absolutely disgusting. Mm. But, but in this when country... When I raised that topic, I was demonised. Craig Kelly raised that topic in Parliament. He was demonised. You lot really are beyond the pale. But it's beyond the pale that in this country we still sell the lie that transferring to renewables will means everything will be cheaper, energy will be cheaper. When in the US they've acknowledged that this transfer to a carbon neutral economy is actually going to hurt. It's going to kill people. It's going to kill people. In the UK, in Europe, they seem to be a little bit more honest about the discussion. So here we sell this lie that this is only not going to slash emissions, but it's going to slash your electricity how, costs. I'm sorry, how this doctor can uh, live with herself is beyond me. Just, oh, no, the, the, Hippocratic oath, I... the Hippocratic Oath do no harm to patients. This person has done a study which shows that these people will, will suffer significant ill health due to these policies, and yet she supports them and goes to the election. I'm sorry, sorry, no words, no words can describe my feelings towards that. Anyway, let's move on. Joining us now is a young woman that gives, does give us hope for the future, uh, for future generations in this wild world of wokeism and stupidity. Well... She's a teenager. She's also a political correspondent. Sophie Kokorin, welcome to Outsiders. How are you, Sophie? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Well, we're really good here. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you, you've done uh, great work. Co you went to Davos and covered the World Economic Forum. Uh, you, you, you're on social media a lot. You're a political correspondent. Tell us a bit about yourself and how you came to get so involved and how you came to be so smart. You can see through all, all this woke rubbish. Tell us a bit about yourself, Sophie. 
Um, I'm a first year student here at uh, the University of Durham and I study business. I've always been a political girl, always been right wing. I don't see the left at all. I think they chat a load of nonsense, to be quite honest with you. And the reason why I got into politics is because I was in sixth form last year, so what would be the last year of high school for, for many countries, and they closed the schools and cancelled my exams. And uh, at that point, I was furious. I was outraged by the whole COVID thing. They stole our, our the, probably the best years of our lives away from us for something that is effectively the flu for our age group. And, and I was absolutely outraged and nobody in the media was talking up for young people and exposing the damage that they've done to us and other young people. So I decided to get involved in it. Yes, I so, so, Sophie, you, um, you went to Davos. I want to ask you about Davos in a second. But first of all, just tell us, you probably heard us earlier talking about the Jubilee. You've also met, met give us your thoughts on the monarchy and the Jubilee. Uh, it's been an absolutely wonderful weekend for us here in the UK. We have had a really tough two years. And to be quite honest with you, we've got another few tough years coming uh, because of the cost of living crisis. It, it's going to be hard for everybody. So to be able to be there for this weekend and have people smiling, you know, flags everywhere. London has returned back to what it always was. It, it's just been it's been so wonderful. And. Ever since the Brexit referendum six years ago, the media have done their absolute best to divide this country as much as they can. And boy, have they failed miserably. And this weekend <laughs> has shown that. This weekend has shown that because it's been wonderful. We're all so united. And it's just, honestly, it's been fantastic. Rita. Uh, but you also seem to have your main political parties united on the issue of climate change. The Boris Johnson government has been very bold in this. <laughs> So is there any uh, debate, given you've got an energy crisis, their costs are soaring, people can't afford, uh, huge numbers of people can't afford uh, the, their energy bills. So is there any change, in, 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 in any challenge to those policies now? No, ultimately, for some reason, our government, and it is a Conservative government, so I think it's quite bizarre, Conservative, shall we say, um, have gone to opt to do a windfall tax on energy companies instead of cutting the green taxes, which is utterly bizarre. But to be quite honest with you, I'm going to speak about this issue quite passionately because all of these climate justice warrior things that are making people in the UK poorer, people like me from normal backgrounds poorer, are done in my generation's name. They're saying that we're doing this for the future of generation. They're doing it for my generation, the Greta Thunbergs of the world. But Ultimately, as a young person, I know that if we go through with these absurd net zero policies, that I'm going to end up not being able to get a job because businesses are going to move abroad, not going to be able to own a home, not going to be able to go on holiday, not going to be able to drive a car, I'm going to have to eat all sorts of strange insects. I do not <laughs> want to spend the rest of my life living in green misery to chase this absurd dream. And uh, let me tell you something, when Greta Thunberg goes to China, then maybe I'll be interested. But until then, I'm not. <laughs> but, but Sophie, but Sophie, haven't you heard the great news about your future? You will own nothing, <laughs> and you will be happy. Um, tell us, you went to Davos uh, for the World Economic Forum. Tell us about what you learned there, and tell us about the kind of world that they think that 19-year-old uh, Sophie Corcoran should grow up and uh, live in and enjoy. And you already talked about bugs, but I assume that there's some pods and other things involved with this. Um, if I had to sum up the World Economic Forum in three words, it would most likely be one, fake, two, undemocratic, and three, a whole load of hypocrisy. The whole thing was just hypocrisy. They give us all these lectures about climate change and tell me how I can never drive a car while flying in by a private jet and helicopter. They want to increase digital surveillance and digital ID, and yet there they are, hidden behind their own little tiny secure zone. So they want, they want to know and see every single aspect of our lives and monitor what we're doing while they themselves get privacy because you know only the rich deserve privacy and again they want an open borders policy that's
I mean, these are unelected people who are unaccountable to the public, sitting behind their little secure zones within accredited media. And the fun fact about those media is that the people that were the accredited media, so the only ones that were actually allowed to be in there and ask the questions, were also sponsoring the events and also had guests that were invited as part of the conference, not for the media team. So how on earth can we trust these people to be honest and to be transparent and to ask the questions that we need? I mean, it is utterly just grotesque and it, it was in some remote location in the middle of the swiss alps it wasn't in a major city like zurich or geneva so it was impossible for normal people to get there and these are the people that are determining the narrative for for our lives and yet here we are no democracy whatsoever and it's the same for the world health organization as well with that treaty and this is why our prime minister and your prime minister shouldn't sign it and the reason why our prime minister shouldn't sign it is because six years ago 17 million people in my country voted to leave the european union and they voted to leave the european union on the premise that we'd get rid of unelected officials from foreign countries telling us what to do and that is exactly what the world health organization and the world economic forum do so we shouldn't we should cut ties with them because it's undemocratic democratic any country that respects democracy will not sign that world health organization treaty and will not have any part of the world economic forum so vicar and love your passion love your enthusiasm you went there you did what so many other people didn't you actually find out on the ground you went there well done you've got a glittering career in front of you i imagine in journalism and in politics uh keep up the great work and i hope we can speak to you again so vicar and thanks so much for joining us from the uk from durham and thanks for staying up so late we do appreciate it <laughs> now we've always I said news. i hope you enjoyed it thanks for coming across to rumble and uh, and subscribing